To those who are an HR department of one, how are you finding the time to juggle the nuances of wage and hour laws, FLSA compliance, all while making sure that you have time to curate recruitment processes, engage your staff, and just accomplish the basic admin tasks that come with the job? Today, I am bringing on Jennifer Chang, a knowledge advisor at SHRM, to discuss how to understand and apply the right FLSA policies, how to rid yourself of HR recruitment and admin burden, and finally, how to educate employees on compliance-related matters. Let's get right into it. To give a little background on Workforce.com, Workforce is a full-service HCM software company that specializes for businesses with hourly staff. So think everything from scheduling to payroll, time and attendance, HRIS, and so, so much more. Because we work with thousands of businesses from California to New York, we understand how difficult and, quite frankly, pretty annoying it is to remain compliant with these ever-changing FLSA regulations, wage and hour laws, fair work week standards, you name it. I am joined today by Jennifer Chang. Jennifer is an HR knowledge advisor at SHRM. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So Jennifer has worked primarily in the government contracting industry in a variety of roles as an HR practitioner. Practitioner, She worked as a generalist, specialist, and director. She particularly enjoys assisting SHRM members by being surrounded or being a sounding board and providing guidance and resources to help navigate complex employee relations issues. So I'm sure you've been, you know, around in terms of HR issues that are really prevalent (laughs) today, especially for those smaller, smaller teams that, you know, we're talking about when it's just one person on the (laughs) HR department. We have, yeah. Um, So at SHRM, we offer guidance and resources to our members to help them address HR issues in the workplace. Um, We answer everything from employment law regulations. Uh, We talk about common practices and act as a sounding board, as you alluded to, for HR practitioners who are working with really complex um, employee relations issues. And that's very, very prevalent for the folks who are HR departments of one, simply because they don't have someone who's like-minded, who has a similar background to bounce ideas off of. So we serve in that capacity for them. Awesome. And how often are you assisting members who are the only HR at their companies? Oh, daily. All day, every day. (laughs) And that's nothing against Um, folks who are an HR department of one, it doesn't speak to their capabilities as an HR practitioner. It just speaks to the fact that they're alone and they need someone perhaps to help them do a gut check. We'll do quite a few calls uh, where folks think that they know what they need to do and they just want to talk about it with someone to make sure that they've thought through all the aspects of a particular situation. Mm. And then what are the more common questions you get from this group of people typically? Oh, yes. We handle a lot of questions dealing with ADA regulations, um, how to work through a request for a reasonable accommodation, what that would look like for the employee and the employer. Uh, We talk a lot about FMLA regulations and really complex and nuanced employee relations issues. that's a bulk of what we handle on a daily basis. Nice. And Unless there's see, something. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. no. I was just going to ask if there's any common mistakes that you often come across oh. uh, when you know you're talking with these solo HR departments. Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily consider it a mistake. It's more just. Um, not like looking at it through our own lens, like we mm-hmm. each have our own blinders on or we're only thinking about it from our knowledge base and our history as an HR practitioner. So it's not necessarily a mistake. It's more just looking at things from a broader perspective. And that's why they call us to uh, use us as a sounding board so that they can help examine these issues from all different angles that they may not necessarily be considering. In terms of compliance related questions, how often are you fielding these types of questions typically? All day, every day. I'm sure. (laughs) Because it's always changing. Um, Like the second you think you've got something nailed down, um, a new law comes out or a new way of handling something. Um, You know, for instance, California just increased their sick pay 
regulations. It used to be three days um, mandated annually, now it's five days. So we've gotten a lot of questions about that lately, how to put the new regulations into practice and ensure everyone's staying compliant. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. It perfectly leads me into this first section, talking about how to understand and apply the right FLSA specific policies. Mm -hmm. So I want to point to this first slide. Let me pull it up very quickly. So this slide, obviously talking about HR and FLA, FLSA compliance protocols. We're looking at the classification of employees, monitoring work hours, minimum wage compliance, overtime calculations, and record keeping. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer, my question for you is, what are some key FLSA policies that you would highlight for those who are the only ones in their HR department within these shift-based industries, you know, retail, manufacturing, hospitality, and so forth? Sure. Yeah, I would just make sure that the basics are covered. Just get back to the bare bones of the FLSA to start. So ensuring that everyone is paid um, the correct wage per minimum wage regulations, whether that's the federal or if the state is more generous, um, ensuring that overtime is being paid correctly um, and that time is captured correctly. Um, so folks who are non-exempt that when they're working, that work is being captured as uh, compensable time so that they are paid mm -hmm. accurately. Definitely, definitely. Are there any resources that HR should look into to kind of better understand specifically these FLSA laws? Oh, sure. So the Department of Labor is a great resource and they actually have an FLSA overtime advisor and it's um, almost like a quiz you can take. So you can go through the different um, questions to see what's required of an employer in a particular situation. Um, SHARM also has a ton of great resources. We have um, what we call HR Q&As um, that have charts in them that show, for example, when time is compensable for, um, for travel for non-exempt employees because that gets kind of hairy. <laughs> and then uh, we also have toolkits that walk employers through how to calculate overtime. For instance, if there's, I mean, normally it's just one and a half times your annual, or not your annual, but your regular rate of pay. But what happens if you worked three different kinds of shifts and had to three different kinds of pay in a work week? Um, so they cover those kind of scenarios as well. That's a really good point. I think the idiosyncrasies within these laws are really where a lot of HR departments, specifically those who are the only ones in this HR department, in their department, mm -hmm. where they trip up. You know, there's a lot of nuances to these laws and regulations. And as you said, they are constantly changing. So making sure that you are staying on top of it. I know for me, something that's been really helpful is setting Google alerts whenever there is something with, um, you know, FLSA, wage and hour, overtime, anything like that. I set these alerts so it actually comes up right in my inbox and like a nice neat little uh, folder kind of um, just right in my email inbox and I get to see it every morning to see kind of comb through if there's mm -hmm. any changes. Um, so yeah, that's another great resource. I highly recommend that. That's a great idea. I didn't think about doing that. Um, yeah. Oh, it's it's really good. And, you know, Google does a great job of just kind of compiling it in mm -hmm. a nice condensed way. It's great. Very that's much fantastic. recommend it. Yeah. Yeah. I also, um, oh, sorry. No, no, please finish your thought. I would love to No, hear. I was just going to say, I also recommend um, checking reputable law firms, subscribing to their newsletters. Um, that helps too. Anything that can, anything that you can automate, I think is a great way to handle compliance issues if you're an HR department of one. Because it's hard to make time to go out to the interwebs and Absolutely. figure out what's what and what's new. So anything that can be automated so it just is automatically delivered to your inbox um, is just a great, great way to handle things. I mean, automation is definitely huge on our side of things, on workforce.com side of things. We actually, it reminds me of a client that we have, uh, Reef, and they are a parking company. So they pretty much rent out these lots all over mm -hmm. the country. And they have over 18,000 employees. They're huge, right? Over yeah. 10,000 locations. It's a lot of people to kind of manage a lot of different locations, a lot of different rules and regulations across the states. So they actually have a Chicago location that requires fair work week standards mm -hmm. under the Department of Labor, as you might know of. Um, right. And Workforce actually just automates those requirements automatically in their schedule. So it actually helps 
brief um, over, you know, on their HR side of things or HR generalists to automatically have those um, labor specific requirements in their schedules just for the Chicago locations and wherever Fair Work Week standards apply. I know it's just it's not just outside of the Chicago area. It's also California, all that stuff. So again, automation is key. Whatever you need to do to actually, you know, utilize it to your advantage, mm -hmm. do that because this is something that, you know, HR is juggling a lot and compliance is just one of those principles that they need mm -hmm. to handle. And there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, it's a very, very hefty load to carry for the company, for sure. It is. It feels very, well, it felt very overwhelming to me when I was in HR department of one. Absolutely. Because if you don't do it right, the company could face fines from the Department of Labor or state departments of labor. There's just such a, a liability there. Um, employees could not get paid correctly. All kinds of stuff could go sideways yeah. if you're not on top of it. But no pressure. Yeah, I'm right. Exactly. <laughs> and it feeds me perfectly in my next question. How can HR mm -hmm. double check that they're actually applying the correct regulations to their businesses and mm -hmm. even business locations? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would suggest, of course, I would suggest joining Sure, I really, I mean, I'm not a salesperson, but I think we are a fantastic resource um, because one, you can just look at the website to see what's going on and how it applies to what organizations. You know, for instance, certain sick leave laws only apply if you have an organization that's a certain size. You can quickly check that to say, oh, well, I only have 10 employees, so this doesn't apply to me. Um, you know, we all have, um, you can also call a knowledge center if you ever have any questions about things. Um, I also recommend teaming with the C-suite and legal counsel, if that's available to you, um, just to have buy-in from yes. the leadership, which I think is critical. Um, it sounds dry and boring. Com compliance just does. Um, but I think putting numbers behind it and showing folks in the C-suite what could go wrong if these measures aren't in place, um, I think that's really helpful. So they understand the big picture. Um, you know, you're not just laying down the law and enforcing regulations. Like this is for the betterment of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and then contacting legal counsel as well, just to make sure that the regulations are interpreted correctly and they're being uh, enforced correctly in the workplace and applied correctly, not enforced correctly. But yeah. I, I think that's a great, great point. We actually had a webinar a couple months ago on how to get by and you know, how HR can mm -hmm. lead from the front. And yeah. I, I think that's such an impo important key of teaming up with other teams outside of just the HR department, especially <laughs> when you're the only one there, it's a little hard to look to yourself to right. know exactly what to do. Right. So mm -hmm. exactly teaming up with legal, even if it's outsourcing that, because I know a lot of these smaller companies, of course, don't have an in-house legal team. So of course, looking to other resources, you know, like Jennifer said, right, looking at websites, subscribing to newsletters, even contacting them and seeing if they, there's a rate that you can get them to advise and making sure that you guys are compliant with those regulations that are applicable to your business based on your state, of course. So in terms of these smaller teams, right, a lot of these HR, solo HRs are building up these protocols really from the ground up because there's nothing there when they get there, right? They're walking through the Terrifying. door and someone hires them and they're like, perfect, <laughs> can you buy, build up all these compliance protocols? So mm -hmm. my question for you is, do you have any recommendations here on how to build a solid compliance protocol or program really from the ground up? Well, first of all, start by taking a deep breath. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. Like, um, that goes for everybody. That goes for everything. Not everybody. <laughs> let's just all it, take a moment. <laughs> sometimes when you walk into, like, let's say you become the HR person, the mm -hmm. HR department for a small business who not maybe not has not had HR before. Um, I would say one, take things one thing at a time. Um, I know for me in particular. I look at everything that needs to be fixed and then my brain just goes haywire. Yeah. So rather than looking at this giant to-do list, just do one thing at a time, get one thing right and then move on to the next thing. I would start with I-9s, making sure that everybody has an I-9 on file um, and those that may need um, 
to be re-verified that all of their documents are on file and correct and they're good to go. Um, and then, you know, go from there. Once that's done, make sure that everyone's got uh, correct tax forms, offer letters, uh, all of that, uh, you know, company policies, mm -hmm. and get that solid, and then move on to the next thing. Um, but just, you know, just one bite at a time. That's yeah. way easier said than done. I know. I know. <laughs> I yeah. Cool. I mean, honestly, even everything you just mentioned, um, we have our like onboarding feature on our side and it actually automates all of that for you. So again, if we're going right. back to the theme of automation, it's okay. talking about, you know, there's that checklist within the onboarding feature that can quite literally get an employee onboarded in three minutes compliantly, like That's completely awesome. compliantly. There's no mishaps there. Yeah. So they get their employee handbook, they get mm -hmm. all their forms, W4, I9, whatever it is that you have, they get that all sent out to them. They fill it out, uh, get it back to you in an automated way mm -hmm. and uh, you know, all on technology, on the desktop, on your phone, whatever it is. Yeah. And yeah, it, I mean, it makes life so much easier. We've had such good feedback since rolling this out and it's been amazing. And just in terms of, again, lowering that admin work is mm -hmm. absolutely huge and taking those one steps at a time you know just making sure you're making those baby steps i mean this is essentially the same thing as one giant step forward though instead of kind yes. of making it that little you know incremental and you have more time to build up those programs from the ground up mm -hmm. and start auditing those programs auditing uh, your processes that are might already be in place as the hr department of one so Whatever it is that helps to kind of, again, take that burden off is huge. And it perfectly feeds me into this next part, sure. talking about how to rid yourself of HR recruitment and admin burden. <laughs> you know, we wanted to focus on the recruitment side of things. It's okay. something that, you know, I know I've been hearing um, on our side of things where recruitment is like one of the most time consuming parts of HR. So I'm like, let's just focus on that first and foremost. So. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of that doc documentation and admin falls within the recruiting process that we all know and love. So, Jennifer, my question for you is what strategies or tools do you recommend for streamlining the recruitment process, taking consideration uh, today's very, very tough labor market? Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say, well, again, this is an easier said than done thing, because depending on a company's budget, I would say if they can invest in some kind of applicant tracking system. Mm -hmm something to your point where they can automate processes so that uh, like you said when a candidate applies all of those uh, admin tasks are automated and they can submit their application online uh, and go through that process and then other stakeholders I think this is a huge part of the admin process for an HR practitioner or a recruiter um, is connecting with the other stakeholders in the organization, a hiring manager, a future supervisor, you know, the CFO who has to make the final call on a salary so that they can all talk within that system and that's automated rather than an HR person needing to track everybody down all of the time. Yeah. That could be a challenge. A hundred percent. Actually, I wanna share this um, next slide, if I can pull it up. There we go. Talking about phasing and the recruitment process, right? I think mm -hmm. breaking it down, and I, this is a great slide. It's actually um, inspired from this website called Insperity. And there's two phases that they're looking at, the pre-employment phase and the onboarding phase. And again, mm -hmm. that applicant tracking system that you're talking about, it's absolutely key, especially for that pre-employment phase. I know there's a lot going on here, but just to quickly run through it, some of the main points on the pre-employment side of things, develop and document a detailing company's organizational structure that reflects the job profiles. Obviously it will be useful for clarifying roles, be compliant with the FLSA. Obviously it's a huge theme of today's webinar, mm -hmm. right? Enticing job descriptions. That's just good marketing 101. It is. And then develop employee handbook that would be shared on the employee's first day. Again, this is automated. Uh, if you're a workforce client, you know, the onboarding feature is great for that. So yeah. And, applicant tracking system is huge, huge for this pre-employment phase. Jennifer, I don't know if you had any other tools or, you know, technology that you'd recommend um, to kind of help phase in uh, the pre-employment phase and kind of lower that admin work. 
I think that's the biggest one. I can't really think of anything else other than making sure your applicant tracking system connects to your HRIS mm -hmm. so that once the pre-employment phase is complete, the candidate, now employee, can easily move into uh, the employee role and fill out all of their tax forms, their I-9, all of that, and create their employment record. Absolutely. We actually, yeah, of course. Oh my God, of course. And we actually just released um, our own applicant tracking system for those who are wanting to check it out. But I mean, it's perfect for, I mean, taking the entire pre-employment phase that we're looking at here, mm -hmm. it completely handles that as a whole this applicant tracking system and it's perfect for those who are HR departments of one. I mean, it's ideal um, just again to get employees hitting the ground running. And again, our onboarding feature handles the onboarding phase. So really just lowering that admin work has been really, really important. And I know for our companies who are size, you know, from one employee all the way up to around 50, those who have that HR department of one, I mean, I know the ATS system and the onboarding feature have been really, really crucial for them. It is. It's one. It's just one less thing to do. Absolutely. So, yeah. It's just a lot of paperwork otherwise. Um, and that can feel very overwhelming when there's employee relations issues knocking on your door uh, and all kinds of other good stuff that you have to work through. <laughs> right. And and again, I that's such an important part in talking about employee relations and doing things that help the culture of the company as mm -hmm. a whole, if you're not going to have time to even work on that and you're busy being held up with the recruitment paperwork or, you know, tax forms, whatever it is, compliance protocols, it's really hard to actually improve the overall culture and employee engagement and reduce turnover. I mean, it's all mm -hmm. a snowball effect, right? So making sure that you're actually yeah. putting time aside to audit your processes that mm -hmm. might not even be there to begin with or you know that are already there when you walked in the door on your first day as an mm -hmm. HR department right. one it's really important to be sure that you're double checking those processes that might already be in place yeah I think it's worth it in the beginning to take the time to make those processes and set everything up so mm -hmm. that even if you don't have an applicant tracking system, if that's not even the budget, it, if at least you know the process mm -hmm. and know what you have to do so that it becomes muscle memory and the other people involved in the process know exactly what to do. And that goes, and it goes into training um, everyone involved on their role, but just so that everyone's on the same page, you know what's expected and make it as routine as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We kind of talked about this a little bit. We touched on it, how in, to ensure compliance in the recruitment and documentation mm -hmm. process. Obviously, it's crucial, right, across right. the board, but especially in the recruitment process. So in the absence of a dedicated compliance team, dedicated mm -hmm. legal team, how can a lone HR stay on top of legal requirements and industry standards in the recruitment and documentation process? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of it is kind of the same as before for other compliance issues. Um, I would recommend um, subscribing to uh, reputable law firm articles. Um, I definitely recommend getting a SHRM membership. We have an HR weekly newsletter that we send out among other things. So all of those new laws like the pay transparency, regulations that have come out lately, um, those are all delivered to someone's inbox so that they don't have to go out and search for it. I think that's the hard part. So if that if it can, that data can come to someone's inbox and then they can say, oh, well, this one applies to us or it might not, let me talk to legal counsel. That part I think is super helpful to have to have that data in your inbox rather than have to, you know, think about it. Um, because sometimes um, just thinking about one more thing makes our heads explode. So <laughs> sounds about right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Especially around the holidays. <laughs> Tell me about it. I mean, truly. And out of those checkpoints, are there mm -hmm. any that, you know, HR departments should prioritize over the other, would you say? I would say anything, um, anything that is regulated by state or federal law. So mm -hmm. like the new pay transparency laws that have come out recently um, in all of the different states um, or the drug testing regulations that are 
kind of influx and changing with the new legalization of marijuana laws? Like, what does that look like for an employer in terms of their pre-employment testing, their drug testing, um, their job postings, anything like that where they could potentially face um, liability if it's not set up correctly? It really, it, it really feeds into that aspect of, you know, educating your employees, right, and making mm -hmm. sure that they understand what the regulations should be. And again, we mm -hmm. kind of talked about the employee handbook. Yeah, a great resource, but rarely used, I would argue, <laughs> rarely <laughs> opened, rarely looked at from the employee side of things, unfortunately, mm -hmm. right? We wish that they were reading that every night, flipping through the pages, but that's simply not the reality. Yeah, the reality awesome. is that um, a lot of employees actually are pretty educated on, you know, compliance laws, wage and hour mm -hmm. laws, overtime laws. And there's a slew of lawsuits that you see within hourly wage industries that support this. So it's making sure that they're actually well educated on your side of things, but to help stay compliant as a company. Mm -hmm. So it feeds me great into the, my next point on how to educate employees on compliance related matters. Mm -hmm. So talking about, um, you know, turnover, I think it's a really important part. Let me share my screen really quickly. So if we're looking at this next slide, if it loads, there we go. So looking at compliance education tips and tricks and really kind of simply breaking it down and do, you know, the first one being utilize real life examples and storytelling. Again, there is so much, yes. so many lawsuits out there that support these findings on, you know, making sure that your employees are well educated on why they should remain compliant. Um, number two, engaging employees from the top down, you know, managers to frontline staff, making sure that they're constantly communicating with their frontline staff. Mm -hmm. Number three, don't be afraid to enforce accountability. I think that this is something, especially as solo HR departments feel like they're constantly the bad guy. Mm -hmm. I think making sure that you're so comfortable with enforcing accountability is absolutely huge. So Jennifer, my question yep. for you is, you know, what sort of protocol or practice should HR have in place to actually help educate employees on important compliance protocols and principles, considering, you know, time constraints as yes. they are the only ones, they are. HR, <laughs> right? So they only have so much time to sit everybody down and talk to them. But what would you recommend here? I would recommend, uh, well, one, there's a couple options. It depends on the budget for uh, an HR department and a company as a whole. One would be to outsource these compliance training requirements and have someone external come in um, and conduct the training and also develop the training because developing the training um, can be time consuming as well. So to have someone come in and provide perhaps the sexual harassment training compliance uh, requirements every year, um, that might be a great option. Mm -hmm. Or uh, involving managers, as you alluded to, um, and other executives so that the HR department of one isn't doing everything. Like perhaps um, the manager, like the HR department could develop the training materials, um, but the manager could uh, provide the slideshow. Um, and they don't necessarily have to actually give the presentation, but if they could send it out to everybody and ensure that everyone's taking care of it, um, just really involving other people. I think that's that's something that's super important for an HR department of one so that they're not the one developing the training, managing the training, and making sure that everyone is trained. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, again, partnering with <laughs> managers, with other teams is Absolutely important. Uh, do you recommend, you know, any e-learning tools or like digital platforms, any technological solutions that can actually yeah. help deliver this training that we're looking for yeah. with employees? I don't have any direct recommendations. I will plug SHRM, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we do offer sample training presentations that are already developed. Now they're kind of at the federal level. So an employer might need to tailor them to their state specific regulations but 90% of the presentation is already written and that is available to our members so that they don't have to recreate the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of folks get overwhelmed by the fact that they have to actually create a training presentation in addition to giving the presentation and ensuring compliance. So that's taken care of. Um, and state 
websites like Department of Labor websites for each state that do have specific training requirements often will have sample presentations available as well. So that's a resource to look at. That's awesome. I, I really, I like the idea of bringing in someone external, um, mm -hmm. even if it's for a day to just audit practices and then they give mm -hmm. the recommendations on, hey, you guys need to tighten up here. You guys need to make sure that people are clocking in, clocking out on time, whatever it is that they recommend mm -hmm. and enforcing that and maybe doing that a quarter, maybe even twice a year, whatever mm -hmm. it might be that fits for your company's needs. Yeah. We actually have um, the safety management feature that just got released and it's not so much on the FLSA side of things, it's more on the OSHA side of things yeah. where making sure that, you know, obviously customers, employees are safe. Um, and again, putting the power in the manager's hands a little bit more and handing that off to them and saying, okay, here's a checklist, here's the safety management checklist right. that you need to make sure that your employees are going through and they can assign these checkpoints to their employees, to their frontline staff. Mm -hmm. And it's just that continuous education. And again, bringing somebody in and saying, hey, where like, where does this checklist or what does the checklist need to have on it? Where are we lacking a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of FLSA compliance, OSHA compliance, whatever it might be that you're concerned mm -hmm. about. And yeah, and then applying it to your technology and automating it. I think that's super important. Um, and again, handing it off to those who are in the management side of things trusting your employees with the matters and yeah, mm -hmm. and just making sure that everyone's kind of all hands on deck. Yeah, I think to your point, I think it's really important to explain the why behind all of these compliance issues because someone might be like, oh, why do I have to fill out my timesheet? You're just gonna pay mm -hmm. me anyway. But it really explaining why that needs to be done and the regulation behind it. I think it's really helpful to employees to understand the importance of all of these nitty gritty little things that we might be asking them to take care of. I think that's such a good point. And yeah, you don't wanna overwhelm, right? You never wanna overwhelm the other teams and saying, hey, like make sure that we're doing this and this. At the end of the day, that's on HR. But again, I think making sure that there is continuous improvement and education is super important. Um, do you have any recommendations on kind of creating that culture of continuous education that smaller HR teams can establish? Sure. So one option might be to, well, I mean, it all starts from the top down, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, fostering that continuous education piece might look like providing time to employees. Um, and this kind of goes to the employee relations side of things, but providing time for them to have their own continuous education. It doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily to be compliance issues. It could be something that they need, you know, to better their career or a new certification. So kind of attacking it from all sides, um, just fostering that continuing education piece for the employee, and then also setting those requirements for compliance as well. Like mm -hmm. we are all learning and growing, you know, we need to continue to do better and just kind of having that mindset. Yeah. I love that. And we talked about outsourcing, you know, some mm -hmm. of these laws, regulation, compliance protocols, and making sure that, hey, it's double checked. And I think that's really important. But for those that might not have that resource or, you know, that access, do you have any recommendations on how HR can actually assess the effectiveness of their compliance training programs as, you know, a department of one? Sure. One idea, um, well, this is straight from Sherm, but <laughs> one idea is we have compliance checklists available. So download those and just go through the list to make sure that all the boxes are ticked. Mm -hmm. um, another option kind of to go back to your OSHA um, piece of the conversation is often state OSHA departments will come in and do an assessment for free. And I know that might be scary, because you know you don't necessarily want to invite OSHA in <laughs> to <laughs> assess everything, but it's kind of um, a visit from an OSHA department to like a friendly visit just to assess everything and see where they are. Um, so if there's not any monetary resources to buy, um, you know, a consulting session or something like that, that might be a good option. Yeah, I love that. We actually in a couple days or so we are going to record our how to prevent osha lawsuits with liz peterson over oh, at Liz. <laughs> i love liz she's fantastic she'll probably she's say the same so thing right. i'm so excited to work with her i mean yeah, yeah she is super knowledgeable on the topic mm -hmm. but yeah exactly i mean 
OSHA compliance is a whole nother beast yep. that will attack another day. But it's it's really interesting that you mentioned the free audits that they mm -hmm. actually offer. <laughs> and I think it's so important to use those resources, again, especially those smaller companies that don't necessarily have the finances to sure. outsource and you know look to, or, to a legal team, anything like that. And yeah, looking at those free resources, I think self-auditing, getting somebody else to audit, having an outside perspective, whatever it is, mm -hmm. super, super important. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's worth the time to do it, I think, just yeah. to make sure that everything's set and set right and working well. No doubt about that. I completely yeah. agree. To close out, I love to ask all my guests this question. What are one or two top tips, actions, or takeaways our mm -hmm. audience can leave with to, in this case, better stay compliant when they're an HR department of one? Oh, sure. Okay. So the first thing is to take one thing at a time, mm -hmm. especially if you're walking into um, some place that hasn't had HR yet. My uncle always says, where there is chaos, there is opportunity. And I tell uh, my HR folks that when they call in. So start there. You have an opportunity to shine and develop a wonderful compliance program. Um, another thing is to start by making things right going forward. So create those processes so that future employees and future processes are correct and compliant and then clean up the mess if there is one. Yeah, yeah that would be my biggest tip. I take a deep breath. It will get done, I promise you. I love it. And that, I mean, that's a perfect, perfect third point to end on. Jennifer, thank you so, so yeah. much for joining. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience did too. And there's some great takeaways in here. So guys, be sure to comment down below if you have a favorite part of this webinar. I would love to hear from you all. And Jennifer, again, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. It's so great speaking with you. Awesome. Well, have a great day, everybody. And we'll see you at the next webinar.